conferences are inspiring. It's such a great place to come and to get ideas, um, inspiration, excitement. You know, you, you, when you leave, you still have that feeling. You have all these ideas and this, that. there's that library that you want to build and there's that code base that you want to redesign because of those amazing things that you heard and learned. Um, it might last you for like a week or so and then, you know, you're back uh, in, on the sofa watching TV all day, but at least for a little bit, you get to feel really, really inspired. And uh, this is a talk about excitement. This is a talk about the excitement of the first big customer or several big customers, really about that sort of initial growth phase. The excitement of seeing all those requests come into your system. The excitement of seeing all that data going through. The excitement of all of those pieces of functionality, all that code you wrote, being used by lots and lots of people everywhere. Someone actually like, is using your product and getting value out of it, and that's really, really cool. So it's a talk about how much fun it is to scale, ensuring that your system doesn't fall over as you put more data into it. But this was a really hard talk to put together. Um, <laughs> I'm going to level with you all. This is my first keynote ever, and I'm terrified. I mean, look at this. Maybe the three most famous people in the Elixir community, and me. How weird is that? You've got the creator of the language, creator of the main web framework. And both of them have made so many more things than that. It's not just that, right? And then you've got Sasha, who needs no introduction, especially since he was introduced yesterday. Um, I mean, we've all seen the soul of Erlang and Elixir, right? If you haven't, you should see it. It is amazing. I, I watched the whole thing with my mouth open. And now, I'm here on the stage. Just imagine the imposter syndrome I'm feeling right now. I mean, it really turned into a huge issue. <laughs> a big challenge for me doing this was procrastination. I mean, I, I can do a lot of procrastination, but this really, I went overboard this time. Um, I think a low point was when I really, really needed to work on the presentation, like it was really important. Instead, what I was doing was I was spending time on YouTube watching videos about procrastination. <laughs> this is a meta-level procrastination. I got to the point where I was essentially getting heart palpitations trying to open my presentation. And so my partner was very, very helpful she suggested that I add something nice to the presentation to help motivate myself, and make it less scary. So here are some kittens, and we all get to enjoy it together. And actually, in a couple of weeks, I am getting two kittens of my own. I am really, really excited. If you have na uh, ideas for names, I still haven't decided what they're going to be named, so let me know. So, this is me. My name is Johanna. Um, the only important part of this slide is the Twitter handle. You see, I measure my own self-worth based on the number of followers that I have on Twitter. So, please help me out. You know, take a moment, get your phone out. <clears throat> I mean, you're laughing, but I'm really serious. So... <laughs> uh, so the title of this talk is, you know, how to survive your first big customer as a startup. But really, it's about the transition from the purely feature-focused early-stage startup to that growth phase. Um, this is a picture of the most of the Duffel team in March 2020. This is the last day in the office before all the lockdowns. Um, and 
Really at that point, that's where we were at. We, in that early stage, you really shouldn't, you, uh, you should be focusing on features, right? It's the right thing to do. To get customers, you need features. You can't really afford not to focus on features. You need to build features fast, and you need to be flexible. You're going to keep redesigning, adjusting, you know, getting customer feedback, trying to figure out what works, finding the product market fit. And six months from now, you might be building something completely different from what you have right now. So when it comes to things like performance or scalability, I mean, cutting a few corners is the right thing to do because without features, you don't have any customers. And without customers, you don't have to worry about scaling. And even if you did want to think about it, you don't really know what to test for. Right? You don't have the data. You don't know yet what's going to be a problem. Because customers find really interesting ways of using your system. So the goal of every startup is to grow. But how do you figure out how to do that by several orders of magnitude in a short period of time? I mean, you've started from nothing. You built a product, you got customers, and you need to grow. And that growth phase is what I'll be talking about today. So maybe some companies reach a point where they feel like they're happy and they don't want to grow anymore. But most companies want to grow. Most companies want to be unicorns. So let's say that the day has come. You did it. The sales team, the CEO, whoever, got that one big customer to sign the lighthouse customer. And hearing about this, what you think about first might be, you know, oh, this is really cool. They're going to use all these features that I built. All this new data is going to go through the system. I'm going to be able to like open up the dashboards and look at the graphs go up and up and up. And that's really cool. You just want to sit there and reload and reload and see those numbers go up. And of course, it's probably important to the business as well, but the important part is those numbers going up. Now, of course, in the process of drafting this contract with this really big customer, they specified how many requests per second your system can handle. They made it very clear that, you know, the stage that you're at and what your system can handle. Um, and they put all, and they of course got your feedback on that, right? They need your help to, to figure out the right numbers, how you can sort of safely scale this, what makes sense. And they put that into the contract. Very clear, very, very honest. I'm just kidding. They didn't do that at all. They, they looked at the customer and they were like, we can handle anything. Just send it all our way. It's like, open the fire hose. It's no problem. A billion requests per second, no problem. We can handle that. Um, and you don't even really need to tell us how much you're going to send us. You know, just surprise us. And even better, do it like in the middle of the night on a Saturday. That's perfect. You got it. And this is the point where you might be panicking a little bit. This is actually a video I took of the office um, when they let us know. So now you need to figure out how to survive. I'm going to walk you through sort of what we did, what kind of worked, what didn't work. And um, in this graph, you can kind of see the bottom there is like a little Little, little bump there. It's basically following the bottom line. It's, that's the old traffic. And then what you see going up there is the new traffic. And in our case, we did this in essentially a week. That's how much time we got. So seeing this slide, I know what you're thinking. Wow, she's so good at making diagrams. I know, I know. Um, before I go into the details, I want to give you some context on what we do so that sort of what I focus on in the talk and what I share with you makes sense. So um, 
we have a RESTful JSON API. Our, uh, the service that we provide is um, customers can search for flights and book them um, through our API. That's basically it. What makes it difficult to scale is that these searches are extremely resource intensive. They have huge payloads, megabytes of XML that has to be parsed, processed, manipulated, um, serialized, and outputted. And all of this has to happen in a single request. And it's not just one airline. You know, Often, we'll need to hit multiple airlines. All of this has to happen within a single request. And then we need to do a lot of these, a lot of these requests. It can take hundreds of searches to convert to a single booking. Of course, a company is not just engineering. You have many different functions and departments and roles that affect your customer growth, or are affected by your customer growth. You probably have a finance department. You've got some kind of support. Maybe engineering is the support. Um, you get customer queries. You have a sales team, recruitment team. You've got management. We had to ask ourselves, how many of our processes require manual intervention? How many of them can be automated? And how many of them we just need more people for? Right? So you, you've got the organizational scaling. And then you have the technical scaling. So really, this was a shift in perspective. And the question is, like, how do you actually approach that shift, going from being fully feature-focused to now having to scale while still building features? I mean, where do you even start? There are so many unknowns. How do you tackle that? And I'm sure there are many different approaches to this, but I'm going to share with you our approach and how it worked out. So of course, it's easy to get uh, caught up in the excitement and panic of the situation, especially if you have a short deadline. Um, we did have a short deadline, and honestly, we did panic a little bit. A big learning for us was that once we took a step back and acknowledged that the panicked approach was not really working, we were able to work in a more productive and structured way. Now, I'm not saying that you know, we were pulling all-nighters or anything, but we were trying to solve all of the problems at the same time with no clear plan. And a lot of the things that I'll be sharing with you is sort of the plan that we figured out. So our first question was, can our system actually handle this traffic? And we were fairly confident that it could not. We knew that the piece of functionality that, is, that was most used and ultimately critical to our business, the searches, um, was extremely resource intensive. But we also assumed that there were things that we were not aware of, issues that we would only find once we had that traffic, unknowns. We didn't really expect it to be as easy as just adding more servers. That said, we were not sure how many servers we needed to add. So basically, load testing is where you point some kind of client at your system, and you start sending through some controlled amount of requests um, to see how it behaves. And our goal with these load tests was to establish how we needed to scale our system and to uncover any surprises. Now, some general notes on, like, on load testing. I mean, to get useful results from this load testing, and honestly, in general, just to handle this kind of growth, you need to invest in observability. That means logging, metrics, tracing, application performance monitoring, anything you can do 
to improve your understanding of the system and to find early indicators of issues. Something that was really useful to us was to um, list out all of the dependencies of our system and to ensure that for each one, we had some definition of healthy, some metrics that told us whether this was working or not working. We, you, need thing, you need metrics on things like the database, queue services, data stores, any kind of third-party systems, any kind of services, any um, systems that you're using. For each one, you need to know, you know, what is the error rate? What is the latency? And is that latency changing as you increase load on the system? Because things you didn't expect to fall over will start falling over. You might depend on some uh, service, and it returns in 100 milliseconds or less. It's really consistent, it's really fast. You've never had an issue with it, so you probably never thought about the fact that it could fail. And suddenly, you increase your load by 100x, and every request is taking five seconds and timing out and erroring. Only observability will ensure that you can find these problems in time and to fix them. Now, in load testing, it's not enough to understand your system. You also need to understand the client. You see, a lot of clients, um, there are a lot of clients out there. Um, Siege, Apache, Bench, Work. I'm naming old ones now, but there are a lot of, one, uh, a lot of different ones you can use. Whichever one you pick, you need to understand how it behaves. It probably comes with config options. You can set the request per second. You can set the concurrency. But what happens if you set a concurrency of one and you ask it to do 10 requests per second? And each request is taking 10 seconds. How many requests per second is it actually doing? If you're not sure how many requests it's doing, what kind of load it is actually putting on your system, then it's also really hard to draw any conclusions from the results of the tests. We ended up writing our own load testing client, which was both an awesome idea and a terrible idea. It was an awesome idea because it forced us to really think about what all these things mean, all those config options, what they mean. It also enabled us to create some really cool reporting, um, outputting reports on the, on the results of the test. The reason it was a terrible idea is that it's really hard to write a load testing client. It's really hard to get that right. Like how do you ensure that if you want to do 10 requests per second and you start 10 requests in the, you, at the same time, how do you ensure that all of them actually execute in that first second? How do you know that they did? It's not easy. So for load testing, you need a plan and you need a structure. You can't just fire off a bunch of requests and call it a day. You need to set expectations for what healthy behavior is. I mean, you could set up a load test, fire off a huge amount of requests per second, and they all return really, really quickly. They're all errors, but they return really, really, really quickly. So if you're only sort of um, requirement is that it returns quickly, it was successful, right? Um, to find that sort of healthy maximum capacity of your system, you need to decide what your tolerance is for errors, for timeouts, for latencies. Like, what is an acceptable 99th percentile latency? Having those expectations in place means that you can zero in on what your system can handle. You know, you set up three servers, you run a test, you see what they can handle, you change it to six servers, something else is breaking now, you fix that, you keep iterating on that. Your goal is to calculate the capacity of your system, or at least to ensure that for some amount of traffic, you know that it can handle it. And to do this, ideally, find a critical endpoint, right? Something that might be for example, resource intensive. 
try to figure out what the customer needs from you, what they're going to be using frequently. And that gives you a good starting point. Ideally, you're able to create an identical copy of your production environment. You probably don't want to run these tests on your actual production environment. You might be impacting some other customers. So you get this copy, this clone of your production environment, and you start sending traffic through it, right? Does it fall over? OK, it did. Figure out why. Um, and to do that, you need that observability that I mentioned. And you need the observability really on both sides. You need the observability on the server side, so you can understand what your system is doing under that load. And you need the observability on the client side, so that you can clearly see what the client is doing. Ideally, you generate reports on the client side. So for each run, generate a report, put it into a spreadsheet, and then uh, list out you know, the different factors that play into it. How many servers were you running? What was the size of the database? And keep doing that over and over again. And you can compare your results very clearly. So about some of the issues that you might come across while load testing. Um, the things that might be most noticeable, we can think of as first order problems. These are things like the web server can't accept enough connections. The database connection pool is too small. Um, one thing that we came across was that as we set up our load test, of course, we used an access token for our system. And we used the same access token for all of the requests. And it turned out that the sort of access token lookups in the database were that were normally really, really, really fast and never a problem, suddenly we were seeing a huge amount of contention on that one specific row in the database. That's another example of a first order problem. It happened, happens, th things you can see running a 10 minute load test. But you also have second order problems. These are things like the database growth over time. It's something that you can extrapolate, but it's not something that's going to be incredibly um, visible running a short load test. It can be things like hitting rate limits on third-party ser services. It can be things like, over time, overloading another system. These things are only visible after running at a higher load for a longer time. Now, that probably doesn't mean that you want to run a week-long load test on this uh, production replica that is probably costing you a lot of money. And it's not very easy to iterate on a, a, with a, a week-long you know, feedback cycle where you make a little change, you wait a week, you see the result, you make a little change, you wait a week. That doesn't really work. So you need to think, guess, hypothesize, basically. So all of this comes together into sort of the idea of structured load testing, where you set clear expectations on what you want to see from your system in latencies, error rates. You make sure that you understand your system by adding huge amounts of observability. But you also need to understand your client. Ideally, you create reports, compare results, and you iterate on small incremental changes. Honestly, for us, I think we gained more from the observability and understanding that we got into our system than we did from fixing the bottlenecks. I mean, we had to fix the bottlenecks, obviously. But the observability we gained was huge. So you did it. You went through the process of calculating the capacity of the system. You scaled it. You established that you can handle the traffic required. You turned it all, all on, and it worked. You did it. Now you have to do it again. Once you've survived this process, you need to find a recipe for scaling. 
Maybe you scaled by an order of magnitude or more, but it's not the last time that you need to scale. You need to be able to repeat this and not in panic mode. You need to plan for scaling. For us, it was useful to write everything down, make as many notes as possible, and try to collect that into um, essentially a recipe, a reuse, reusable formulas and um, reasoning about what you need to do to handle increasing that traffic. Have a recipe for the number of servers that you need. Have a recipe for the size the database needs to be for a certain amount of traffic. It might also be a good point to start thinking about redesign. What is your ideal design of the system long term? And what steps in that direction can you take today? Because as we were talking about before, the um, initial phase of the startup is the feature focus. And that's your main focus, your only focus. You're building features. Now that you've gotten to the point where you have the luxury problem of scaling, your priorities have probably changed a little bit. And so the decisions, the design decisions that you made early on might not make sense anymore. And this can be a good time to sort of reevaluate and see if there are things that just don't scale very well. Of course, avoid thinking about rewrites. Avoid the second system. Try to make small, isolated changes and iterate on them as you keep making the changes throughout the flow, eventually you have converted the entire flow and you've got your new design that you want. And this includes planning API contracts changes. The earlier you can start doing that, the better, obviously. So now we get into the section where I want to talk about scaling safely um, and things that will help you do that. Some of the tools that you can use. So. I see some of you instantly yawning. Um, I get it. I had an idea of what SLIs, SLOs, and SLAs were before this process, and, uh, but I don't think I would have been able to really define them very well. So just to make sure that we're all on the same page, I'm going to do that now. Um, service level indicators are essentially metrics. Right? These are things like how many 500s, are you, are you returning to your customers? SLOs are a higher level of that. It lets you define something like failures. And failures can be things like 500s, but it can also be timeouts. It can be any kind of um, anything you would define as a failure, some kind of less useful result that you return to your customer. So this is more like a collection of metrics or, S or uh, SLIs. And then you've got service level agreements, less interesting, more about contracts with customers and making promises. Um, but even if you don't have SLAs, you will want SLIs and SLOs for internal use. And going through this load testing process, you probably have a good idea of what those numbers are right now and where you want them to be. This is a great tool for long-term scaling. If you determine that endpoint X should be returning within 15 seconds at the 99th percentile, that gives you a reference frame to work within when you scale. Unless you've really agreed on how fast or slow something should be, it's hard to monitor for regressions. It's hard to determine whether something is a problem. So I was looking for a different um, auto scaling, and I just couldn't find one, but I found this really cute cat instead, and I decided to just go with it. Um, so now I'm going to be a tiny bit controversial and say that auto scaling isn't really a scaling mechanism. It's a cost effectiveness mechanism. It's about saving money. When you think about it like this, back in the old days, before the cloud, 
if you needed to service a certain number of requests, you needed to handle a certain amount of traffic, you ordered servers and installed them in your data center like to handle that amount of traffic at peak. Now what the cloud and the near infinite computing resources that it gives you and the very fast provisioning of servers gives you is the ability to reduce the number of servers that you have while the traffic is lower. But you can't necessarily rely on it to auto scale upwards without taking risks. If, I mean, think about a scenario with a 10x traffic or 100x traffic, but without doing any load testing or planning, you start seeing requests come in, auto scaling kicks in, it adds more servers and more servers and more servers, and then every request starts failing because the database is dead and people are running around screaming and your office is on fire. It doesn't auto scale bottlenecks, it doesn't auto scale design issues. And it doesn't auto-scale the contention on that single access token. So use it, but use it carefully. Now for something a little bit more specific to Elixir and Erlang. <coughs> Sorry. It's actually a problem for all systems, but it's maybe exacerbated by one of the really cool features of the Erlang VM, which is preemptive scheduling. A coworker dubbed it the hungry Labrador problem. So if you've ever met a Labrador, you know that they love food. They will just eat and eat and eat, and they never stop. And the Erlang VM is a little bit like that. If you start sending a traffic, you give it some amount of work, like give it, uh, the first request comes in, it, that request gets all of the resources available, um, the next request comes in, now they're sharing half of the resources. Very, uh, it's very equal, they get an equal share of the equal slice of the resources. You get a third request coming in, a fourth, fifth, sixth, and of every request that comes in, each one gets a smaller slice of the total amount of resources until none of them can finish in time. And you can fall into a really tricky trap here because with the amazing concurrency tools that Erlang and Elixir gives you, you might have some piece of code that is really slow. Say it takes 10 seconds. But you look at it and you're like, I can make this concurrent and it will be faster. So you use task async stream and you pat yourself on the back and it's now taking five seconds. You've made it a lot faster. In a um, benchmark running one at a time. Now what happens in a live environment, you deploy it, turns out that it's running as slow as before, maybe even slower. Because in, the, in, in an actual production environment, you're probably running this multiple times. There are multiple things running, and they're all sharing resources, and they're all trying to use all of the CPUs at the same time. So before we really talk about how to handle the hungry Labrador, let's talk about concurrency. So um, when we talk about load and traffic, we often focus on requests per second. This is obviously a useful measurement, especially from a client perspective. It tells you how many requests are started per second. But it's missing something when you're thinking about load on your system. It's missing latency. Assuming that your server is doing something while handling a request, and not just waiting around for fun, you're going to see very different load generated by an endpoint that gets 10 requests per second, and each um, request finishes within a second, and one that gets, 10, that gets 10 requests per second, and it takes 10 seconds for each request to finish. It's basically Little's Law, right? This is a useful tool when reasoning about your traffic um, during load tests. It lets you estimate the concurrency of your system. Assuming that you get 10 requests per second, and each one takes 10 seconds, the concurrency or the length of the queue would be 100, looking at your system like a queue. Note that this is assumes even distribution, and reality doesn't really look that way. This is all averages, not peaks. If you want to get a more accurate worst case concurrency, you need to do some more complicated stuff with how you estimate the 
arrival rate and the average wait time. But it's useful in understanding the, the relationship between requests per second and latency, where the concurrency is a more useful tool for estimating the load on your system. So for, mo for a moment now, let's just look at a single machine. Disregard things like auto-scaling for now. You've got the customer controlling the amount of work executed. Right? They send a request, you handle the request. And as we discussed, the Erlang VM will accept as many of these requests as it can. Your web framework will accept as many of the requests as it can. But this, all systems have limits. When you were doing your capacity planning, you probably figured out how many requests per second your server could actually handle. And you know what happens when you get more requests per second than the system can handle. You start getting longer and longer latencies because you don't have enough resources in the system to handle all of the requests that are being preemptively scheduled. You've got the hungry Labrador problem. So this is where you want to rein the Erlang VM in a bit. Defining these limits is healthy. It is better to throw away some requests than all of your requests failing. I know, again, this is a controversial uh, concept. I think as software engineers, we don't really want to admit that that should ever happen, right? So I'm just going to say it again. Throwing some requests away is better than all your requests failing. You can set these limits in a static way. You say, this server can handle 200 concurrent requests. And if it's getting more, you start saying no. You can set it in a dynamic way, where you say that as long as the latency stays within 15 seconds, it's fine. But if it goes over, we have to start saying no. But either way, setting limits is healthy. And now we can bring back things like auto-scaling and thinking about the bigger system as a whole. As long as it's all working, those concurrency limits are not going to get hit. It's not a problem. But at least you know that in that worst case scenario, your system is not going to fall over. It's going to gracefully degrade. It's going to throw away some requests rather than all of them failing. And of course, these concurrency limits don't just come into play looking at one server in your setup. It's also relevant for third party systems. As you're as your traffic increases, you risk taking down third-party services or your own services running internally, any kind of systems that you rely on. For all of these, there are limits. So when I'm talking about concurrency limits and throwing requests away, you might be thinking, oh, you don't need to do that. You just put a queue in front of it. But queues don't increase throughput. If your system is handling 10 requests per second, and you're getting 20 requests per second, adding a queue will just move the problem from your system to the queue. Since the queue is now growing faster than your system can drain it, the time requests spend in that queue will just grow and grow and grow until they all fail. Queues can work as burst protection, though. If you get a large number of requests in one second, and then traffic goes down to a manageable level again, you might be able to work off that queue in time. But this queue also needs limits to ensure that you're not queuing up more work than you can finish. So you also have rate limits. Of course, rate limits are not the same thing as concurrency limits. Rate limits define what you're willing to give each customer. It's a way of ensuring that you don't end up paying more for that customer than you can really afford. It's a way of finding a balance between giving your customers the resources they need while preventing one customer from impacting other customers by taking too much. Maybe the core difference to concurrency limits is that the rate limit is about how large a slice of your resources you're willing to give that customer, rather than necessarily working as a mechanism to protect your system. So to, to sort of recap that part, these are some of the tools that you can use to scale safely. Define SLIs and SLOs. Look at auto-scaling, but do it carefully. Think about hungry Labradors and setting limits.
And that brings us towards the end of the talk. So to recap what I've gone through today, um, I've talked about shifting your perspective from that early startup feature focus into more of a growth focus, or at least having to care about growth. I've talked a lot about observability and the importance of observability in understanding your system. We talked about load testing, and defining a recipe for scaling long term. And I know it's boring, but it, I do think it's important. Setting clear expectations with SLIs and SLOs and setting limits to your system. If you have one takeaway, just set limits to your system. Actually be deliberate, explicit, and aware of the limits of your system. So we survived this process, and you will too. But hopefully what I've shared can at least help you do it confidently and without any sleepless nights. And I also hope I was able to share some of that excitement with you, the excitement of the first big customer. So have a great rest of your day, and thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Johanna. Um, we have some questions, and if, you, uh, if anyone here has questions, if they could come line up down here um, to ask. Uh, we have an online question from Sebastian, and we'll try this again. Sebastian, if you will uh, unmute yourself, you can, I believe you can ask the question, and we can all hear you. We, we, we know it works, Sebastian. We're waiting on you. <laughs> okay, so I will read the question. I will be Sebastian. Uh, this is from Sebastian Ortiz. When doing the load test, how did you manage the third-party API requests? Did you mock all those requests? Um, no, actually, we did not. <laughs> And um, we did hit some interesting rate limits, for sure. Um, I guess there are certain risks, like you don't necessarily want to do that blindly. But as long as, oh yeah, so I, what we did was we did use a, a separate environment. So for those third parties where it was possible, where they had more than one environment, more than one sort of access token or, or uh, rate limit counter that we could use, we used the other one. So we didn't use the production one. It didn't impact production in that way. And that's a really good question, actually. It's a really good point. OK. Um, Sebastian, thanks you. Uh, we'll, we'll try this again. Uh, from Ser Sergey, if you want to unmute. Yeah, I'm here. Uh, hi, Aaron. Thanks for the talk. Uh, I was uh, curious what exactly was the uh, was the metrics that you were looking at to get an observability. What exactly were we looking at getting observability on? I mean, yes, that is a, is a great question. Um, it's not as easy as uh, this is a list of the things that you specifically need to get observability on, but you want to think about your system. What dependencies do you have to your system? And it might take you a while to find them all because they sort of, they sort of sneak in there in your code base, right? And um, you want to think about which ones are critical and how critical are they. If you have some really important functionality in your system and that depends on third party or it depends on services in general, um, list those out, find those, and ensure that you have metrics that indicate health for each one of them.
Is that cool? <laughs> yeah. Thank thanks. you. Thank you, Sergi. That's awesome. Technology. Okay. Hi. Hi. <laughs> uh, thanks for sharing the story. It was awesome. Uh, my question was uh, about the load testing. So you mentioned that uh, you actually spun up a new environment that kind of mimicked your production system to do the load testing. So one thing that we uh, we were kind of considering when, when we were talking about load testing at my company was uh, that the, uh, the artificial environment might not match the actual, you know, the, the requests are going on the, on production, uh, the complexity, uh, complexity, complexity of them, and uh, it's always a, a kind of a, a model, right? It's, it's not the real traffic that you'll, you'll be uh, seeing on production. So my question was how did it match uh, the actual capacity? So the capacity that you've uh, estimated on the uh, mock system, uh, did it match the capacity of the production system in the end? Yeah, that is really interesting because Obviously, running in that production environment, you can have lots of other requests that are doing other things, and that impacts um, the performance of your system. No, um, interestingly, uh, what we found was that our secondary uh, system, the, the, the copy, the clone, the clean one that didn't have the, any of the other, other extra stuff, actually performed worse than our <laughs> real production environment. It's very unexpected, um, but at least, uh, we were fairly clear about, based on the, the traffic we had seen so far, even if it was much, much lower load, we were fairly clear about what parts of our system were problematic or where our issues were. And so we, that was what we focused on. Um, and it worked out fairly well for us. Uh, that doesn't, and, and I think maybe because it was so clear, we had that one endpoint that was the problem, um, and that might not necessarily be everyone's experience. Cool, thanks. Thank you. Hello, thank yeah. you for a great talk. Uh, so, what are the scenes uh, you have spent a lot of time and efforts for, and now when you have experience, you understand that it could be done easier in more effective way? Do you have some? Yes. Um, are you thinking about the scaling process, or are you thinking about code in general? Uh, in general. In general. Wow, that is a difficult question. I think, I think the big things for us were about that shift in perspective. So early on, focusing on features um, and just making that, making it as easy as used as possible, easy, easy to use as possible, we made decisions that weren't necessarily scalable long term. And that, um, again, it's, I think it's a valuable trade off because, again, if you don't get customers, then you're not going to have the problem of having to scale anyway. Um, but there were definitely sort of design issues in the system that made scaling difficult for us. Thank you. Yeah, I actually had a similar question. Uh, so if you would do it again, do, would you still like do the features first and then uh, look into observability and stuff like that later on? Yeah, I mean, nobody writes slow code on pr purpose. It's not like you look at the code and like, I'm, I'm going to do some extra loops here just for fun. Um, you you do have it at the, like in the back of your head while you're working, right? You want to make it you're like you're looking at it, and it's like, oh, this is not quite linear. I could change this here, and it'll be a little bit faster. Um, but I don't think it is a mistake to focus on features. Like where it's where it's low hanging fruit, designing it right, and you have maybe you have an idea of you've seen things that work that worked in the past in other places. I try to go in that direction, but again, if you're if you're not getting, if you don't have the features, you're not going to get the customers. If you don't have the customers, you don't need to worry about uh, scaling. So I don't think it's a mistake to do that. I think you should be fully feature focused. Mm -hmm. 
And now that you have kind of big customers, have you also changed your uh, development process? Like uh, once you think of new uh, features, do you automatically also think about, oh, how I'm going to observe how this works as well? We do. We do think a lot more about that. And I think um, the crucial thing there is the SLIs and SLOs to actually start thinking about defining um, criteria or requirements for how your system is supposed to pre perform, where you can actually start seeing uh, re regressions. Mm -hmm. If something suddenly start, starts getting a lot slower, you'll know about it, where previously you, you might not even notice. It might be like, you know, you're working on it over six months and the performance of that endpoint is, is swinging wildly between like taking 10 seconds and one second, and you're not really necessarily noticing it. Um, so yeah, SLIs and SLOs. Okay, cool. Thanks. Hey, thanks for the great talk. Uh, you mentioned that building the load testing tool was a big problem. So what, what were the biggest challenges? Did you need to scale it to multiple machines, coordinate? Did you use maybe an existing framework and you build on top of it? Uh, no. Actually, Fred, do you want to take this question? <laughs> My coworker who wrote the load testing client is actually here today. I don't know. Um, I, I, think, I think it was the right thing to do at the time. I'm, I'm still not proud of it. I wouldn't probably advise anyone to do this, but we, the problem we were facing is we were using work too, and we were seeing that there was a, we, we, like, as Johanna said, we didn't quite understand it, and we really needed to have some way of kind of trying to pretend to be the client we were expecting. So we wanted some specific client behavior. One of the challenges was just how do you calculate things? Like how do you, you, you need to get the 99th percentile with something that was handwritten in Go. That was one, one problem, but also just getting measurements correctly because it's quite, quite easy to have the measurements influenced by, you know, like you, um, you send a request and then it's, it, it it, take, it actually kind of stops at the client side for a little bit before it goes out to the server. And now you have this delay in even sending the request, and how do you make sure you've accounted for that? And that's what a normal load testing tool will have done, but obviously we didn't. So don't, don't do it most of the time, I would say. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Last two questions. Okay. Hi. I was wondering, how did you set limits to the system? Did you use a library like Regulator, or did you uh, develop something uh, yourself? Exactly. We did actually use Regulator. That's okay. exactly <laughs> what we used. It's a shout out to Chris Keithley okay. uh, for that excellent, li excellent library. That clears it up. Thank you. Uh, hi, I want to follow up on a previous question. So uh, now that you have like a big customer and like a uh, much higher load, uh, does that affect your kind of the way you you work and the kind of enjoyment that you're getting from work because I imagine like if there are like some um, kind of SLAs out there uh, so you, you cannot like do some cowboy coding and hey let's get it to production Friday evening it's gonna be fun and for everybody yeah it's gonna be fun on and I'm gonna see this feature immediately on production so uh, at some point you kind of I, I would imagine you, 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 you can't do that anymore. So did that affect you or your team and, and probably the speed of your development? Because, you know, kind of, I would imagine for somebody, some people, it can be like, oh, I have this cool feature. I want to get it into the customer hands. But it's kind of, oh, you, you got to get it through, let's say, call it like a performance lab to yeah, get it approved. Yeah. I think, I think it has affected us, yes. But it's not been very explicit. Uh, I think we have a culture of, you know, we want to try to um, have as few obstacles as possible. We want to be able to work efficiently, create features, and that it's okay to make mistakes, right? Um, but I would say that it probably has sort of implicitly, um, subconsciously affected us a bit, that we are a little bit more careful and a little bit more like, okay, we really have to ensure that this thing is going to work. Um, because where previously, if we broke the servers, if we, you, we would only lose a very small number of requests, it wouldn't affect that many customers. Obviously, we cared about those customers as well. But um, as the traffic goes up, even 
the system going down for even a second starts having like a real impact. So yeah, for sure. Thank you.